Five of my best with the rock and roll legend, Susie Quattro. Now stay to the end and find out what her number one song is. And don't forget, please subscribe. It allows you to find out when I've uploaded something new and it also helps me. <laughs>
So put some of his drink. And we called it, and he drank it down. We called it the glycerine queen. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> I don't know if he survived or not, but <laughs> what a terrible thing. Hey, do you take this? Yeah, man. You know, you don't want to look uncool in front of the band. So you say, yeah, sure. Sure, I take that. <laughs> um, and we revisited this too with um, um, Hey Queenie and the, the Devil in Me album. Now, one thing about... Um songs that you wrote back then they were often album tracks yes and not singles on purpose but on purpose what you don't know what a lot of people don't know is um we had the arrangement and it worked you know you can't say it didn't work that uh mike and nikki would provide the singles and we would provide 99 percent of the album material there were many, many times, at least 10 I can think of offhand, this song, one of them, where Mike would say, oh, 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 well, we don't want the radio station to flip the side. So let's make this a little bit longer here or put in another chord here or make a little bit less singlish. He did this to us a lot. I'm not going to complain about that because uh, they were very good at writing the three minute single. I mean, there were things, I mean, Mama's Boy was one of our own. Um, Michael, another great track. That came out as a single in Australia. This came out in Australia as a single. Um, there were just we we did write stuff like this, but it was the arrangement until the arrangement was over. It's okay. It's okay. It is what it is. What is your process of writing? It doesn't ever follow anything A B C D E, but there are things that happen more often than not. I'm a, I'm a poetic type talker, and I'm always being quoted by people and. I'll say things and I'll go, oh, and I'll know that something and I'll write it down. A lot of times you'll get a title. This often comes first because the title, like even when you hear it, the song was written, but Glycerin Queen. Immediately you've got that in your head, what it should be. It's a, Hollywood. Immediately you've got that in the head, what, what should be. So the, the title is very important. It sets the scene and it also suggests which instrument you should write the song on. If it's a rocker, I'm a good enough guitar player to write songs. I'm not a failed guitar player. I'm a bass player. Uh, I didn't go from guitar to bass. So if it's a rocker and I want it to be more simplified, I will write it on guitar because I'm not that good. And it comes out very, you know, earthy. Uh, if it's more complicated, I go to the piano where I'm a school musician. If it's more percussive, I'll even go to the bass and drums and write something like that. So... The, the title will suggest, and then you've got to find, let's say you have this great title and you got a riff going and you've got the title. Then you've got to work out what the song's about and you start, you start picturing in your mind what the song's about. You got to get the whole movie in your head before the words start to come. And then once you get your first four or five lines on the paper, it flows, bang, 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 bang. Then, you've, then you're telling a story. And I write very personal. I, I usually don't write fiction. Also, the process for you of writing has gone from writing with people to being able to write, I'm saying being able to write on your own. But I think it's a, there may be a sort of confidence thing that at first you were very young and maybe you needed someone to bounce off of. Was that is that the case? That then um, was that? No, well? actually, the first thing I wrote was a song called Gotta Get Away for the cradle band we were formed cradle that was when i got pushed in the back because my little sister was joining i wrote that by myself i wrote another song called brain confusion by myself so i didn't find it difficult to write i'm a painter i'm a poet i'm a songwriter and i i love working with people but i also like just as much working on my own either i don't have a preference to tell you the truth Either way is fine with me. I have a little thing that I've done for a long time. If I'm with another songwriter or artist or guitar player or whatever, and we start talking about something and I go, boom, oh, great title, I'll say to the person. And if they're also a writer, I'll say, okay, we got to write this together. It's the reason why I said it in front of them. And I stick with that. Okay, the next song, we come to Quattro Scott and pal three heroes that came to prominence during the uh early glam days and this song 
I mean, it's a really haunting, moving song called Pain. Tell me about it. Oh, it's so funny. I um, I had this, we were in the middle of recording. We had to stop for about two or three weeks because Andy was on the road, Andy Scott from Sweet. And uh, I had this bit of a thing in my head. Couldn't get rid of it, in actual fact. And I couldn't get rid of it so much that I called Andy and I called him about eight o'clock in the morning. You don't do that when you're on the road. I should know better. But I did it. And he said, he said to me, Susie, it's eight o'clock. I said, I know, but I got to play this because this has to go on there. We hadn't written for the album yet together. We done a lot of covers. So I so I played it for him. He said, OK, let me get back to you. I've heard it, got it in my head. He called me the next day and he said, OK, I can't get it out of my head. Let's go. <laughs> so so we wrote this song, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song. One of my favorites on the album, actually. Do you need pain for creativity? Yes. In fact, I have a little thing written down on my song pad, which I'm going to be going to later to write because I'm working on stuff for my next album today. We've got 14 songs ready and I'm I'm now putting together three, the three last ones. Um, I wrote down this ages ago and I haven't written it yet, but I will. Pain is the best architect. I like that. <laughs> and does writing a song solve the pain? Yes, because you've turned it into a positive by making something creative out of it. You've explored it, you felt it, you put it out there for other people to feel, and it becomes a product. Yes, absolutely necessary. Otherwise, it just wells in you like poison. You know, get, get rid of it. Now we're coming to uh, a song that obviously from an album the same name that was with your son um Richard and it was the second album that you did together you did No Control and The Devil in Me and The Devil in Me is the title track of of that album um why is that special to you it, it captured something it has more than one reason um we were nearly done with the tracks on this particular album and I was avoiding this riff. Richard, Richard had a riff. And he said, Mom, would you please do some work on that? And I said, okay, I'm ready now. So I went into my creation room, got my song pad out, and started listening to the track. I had had some lyrics. We had the title, The Devil and Me, for a long time. And I had lyrics written for it with no song. And it was inside my lyric book. And I'm listening, and I'm flicking the pages. Because something, as you're listening to the music, something will fly out at you. Just you'll, you'll look at a phrase and it'll go boom and you'll sing it. It'll be right. So I'm flicking away, listening, flicking away. And all of a sudden, the lyrics for The Devil and Me fell out of my book and landed on top of the computer. I went, okay. <laughs> okay. So, And I started to sing it. And it was perfect. Perfect. And it's it's for my mom. And I, I'm a little bit like that, but maybe she... Maybe she plucked it out of the book and said, here's your lyrics, Susan. <laughs> it's I, funny how that happened. It really captures something. And, and I know we're going to get to her in a minute. When I sent KT uh, Tunstall the album, she wrote back and she said, I am a title track person. And this captured me, she said. I love this track. And I'm not I'm not surprised that you're so proud of it. And you're doing all these millions of interviews and it's a groundbreaking album for you and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it captured something. It did. I mean, this album, you just mentioned it, groundbreaking album. I mean, it had the best reviews. It was immensely um, successful um, for you. And it must have been a really, you know, after all the years that you've been making music and performing, it must have been a really positive feeling to be able to to get that come back up again and to really feel alive through that. Yeah, I have to give a nod to my son on this. He um, and I didn't know until we had finished the project and we did a couple. He doesn't really get involved in interviews, but we did a couple together. And he said he wanted to bring back in me that wonderment of when I first began and started having hits and making my first album he wanted that joy to come back to me so he gave he rebirthed me I gave birth to him he rebirthed me and I didn't know he was doing it but he did it and he said he didn't see me he didn't see me not smiling the whole time we were making this album so he did push that Susie Quattro button very very clever very clever <laughs> I mean you said there was this sort of um 
accident type idea where you open a book and the lyrics things fall out and it gives you the um the idea you're very i don't know if this is the right word but you're you're into like these things of um things that mean something that happen that you see something like you know and i've read about séances i've read about <laughs> loads of different things um what is it about that that you that makes you believe it because i've had it since a child I have um, unbelievably strong instincts, too much so, so much so that I can meet somebody and I can tell them all about themselves within five minutes and they always are going, how do you know this? Because I, I don't see facades, I see people. Um, I've always had that sick sensibility. I've always had ridiculously sensitive antenna that is up all the time. And I just thought everybody, as I was growing up, I thought everybody was the same. And then as you grow up, you realize that what you have is quite different. So then you stop talking about it. You just use it, you know? But yeah, I'm real, real ultra, ultra sensitive. I pick things up, hear things, pick things up, you know? It's okay. It's just, it's exhausting sometimes, but it's how it is, you know? You got to trust it. So you've got to trust it. What happens if you pick something up from someone that you find a little bit, negative or you find not trustworthy do you avoid them is that the way well the funny thing is and i can count them on one hand and leave out two fingers so that makes three um but i call you know we all make mistakes everybody makes mistakes when i recall what i go oh god susie that was a bad mistake all three times all three times it was because i had the bad feeling about somebody and i thought i was being unfair and I, I said to my, my inner self, oh, Susie, give this person a chance. Come on, you're misjudging it. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. All three times, I went against my initial instinct when I met the person, tried to like them anyway, and I was 100% correct. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you do that three times in your whole life, I'm 73 now. So I, I do trust that. If I don't like somebody, I don't like somebody. End of story. Okay, we come to, you mentioned her earlier, and I told it, Katie Tunsil and Shine a Light. And, you know, you mentioned what your son said, this sort of rebirth um, that you've been going through. And it's not just a rebirth. This is like, this has gone up a level. It's sort of moved moved to, a, to another stage. Yeah. So tell me about this and why it it's important. To, oh, it, un unbelievable. Um, what we did, our journey is unbelievable. We... We, uh, long story short, I was a fan of hers and I didn't know she was a fan of mine until I saw um, the rough cut of Susie Q, my documentary. And there she was. I went, I was surprised. So I have a mutual friend who's been my fan since the beginning and hers since she began. He did the footage for Shine a Light. And uh, he said, would you like me to arrange a meet? I said, yeah, I'd love to meet her to me so she invited me to the studio where she was working we had a little lunch together we did a little talk da -da 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 -da. we connected pretty quickly and then she said to me i want to move out of my comfort zone and i've got this riff and if i send it to you would you like to write the song with me i said that would be terrific so we wrote overload from the album remotely then we started another one called good kind of hot remotely and at that point i thought something going on here. My antenna was going up. I said, why don't you come down to the house, stay over for a few days. Let's see what we got. And she said, I agree. So we sat on the carpet in the front room where I do all my writing barefoot, songwriting paraphernalia stretched around. And we started, we started to talk. And at some point we'd pick up the bass and the guitar and it would become a song. Did another talk and another song. This is how it happened. This particular one that we're going to play, it's an earworm. It just is in your head from the second you hear it. Beautiful, beautiful song. Very powerful message that everybody, no matter what your color, your creed, your gender, rich, poor, everybody's got a light. And you should find it, switch it on, and never let anybody switch it off. Big, important message. 
just a great song. What did you learn from each other? Has she talked about what she's learned from you from this process? We've both learned something valuable from each other, very much so. Um, I'm an in the fire girl, just the way I am. I will see this pain in front of me or whatever problems, whatever. I'll see it, it's burning. I'll walk right into it, let it burn me, feel what I should feel and walk out the other side and toss the ashes off. KT observes the fire. So I pulled her into the fire and she pulled me out and showed me I didn't have to burn all the time. So we traded our visions a little bit. You know, one for her, the, the most difficult song was If I Come Home. And I pulled her in. She was talking, we were talking childhood things and deep things that, you know, everybody carries with them. And we were going deep into it and embarrassing some of them. And I said, we got to write the song. And she went, oh, no, no. And she went out, out of the room. Went out, out of the room into the kitchen. And uh, I just waited. And she came back, she sat down, I said, ready? She said, yeah. And she has since said in interviews, thank you to me, because it made her get rid of the rage, if you like, you know? And, and that's what it does. Once you turn it into something concrete, then you can, you can leave it be, then it's not eating away at you inside anymore, you know? So anyway, yeah, we learned a lot from each other. We're good friends. We made a terrific album together. It was album of the week on Radio 2. Um, I picked up a, on our behalf from uh, at Boysdale Album of the Year Award from Jules Holland. I do two of the tracks on stage and they go with Storm and she does two. We we both do Shine a Light and I think she does Truth is My Weapon. I do Shine a Light and Overload, which is a rocky one. So uh, yeah, in fact, I was just talking to her just the other day. Yeah, it's good. We have a good collaboration. You mentioned that uh, Katie had that intense feeling of pain and had to leave the room. Isn't that also a sign that this is going to connect to an audience? 100%. Oh, my God. Whenever you whenever you put that out there like that, you know, this is what people are feeling. And, and this is when a song makes sense. I, I'm, I'm one of these kind of people. I mean, sure, there's pop songs, there's happy songs, there's this or that, but... I, I personally like songs that make me feel. If an artist doesn't touch me, I'm not interested. There are big artists that just don't touch me. I don't want to name any names, but there's other ones that just go, oh, and, and they're in my heart, you know? So yeah, when you write a song from that emotion, you're going to touch people. You're just going to touch people. Okay, from these five songs, Hollywood, Glycerine Queen, Pain, The Devil in Me, and um, the song with Katie Tunstall, which has gone out of my head just suddenly. Shine a light. <laughs> Shine a light. Which one is your all-time favourite, your number one? Out of those five. I think it's for its durability and its lasting quality and the fact that it has never gone away. I'd have to say Glycerin Queen. Go on YouTube and look up uh, Suzy Quattro bass solo, Glycerine Queen. I think it's from Vienna. I do a five and a half minute long bass solo at the end of that song that'll blow your mind. And if I if I could just humbly say, I'm very proud of it. <laughs> Brilliant. Suzy Quattro, thank you very much. Thank you. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>